Hello friends and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I'm John Lomakang and I'm always excited to be a part of the study, mm -hmm. especially with my family. And if you've joined us before, you know that's a statement that changes from time to time because our family is very diverse. But today, my, to my immediate left is Jill Marconi, the Vice President of 3ABN. Good to have you here, Jill. Thank you, Pastor John. Good to be here. On Monday, we look at Abraham's love for everyone. Amen. And the singer in Israel, Ryan Day. Ah, well, I've got Tuesday's lesson entitled Abraham's Spirit of Prayer. That's right. And what would Sabbath School be without Shelley Quinn from Texas? <laughs> uh, Wednesday's lesson is Abraham's mission, and it's going to be fun. Yes, and always good to have Daniel Perrin in our pastoral department, who also put his hand to work on Bible study guides. Mm -hmm. Always good to have you, Daniel. Thank you, and I have Thursday's lesson, Submission to God's Will. Wow, and all of that together is what we call God's mission and then my mission. And we thank you for taking the time to join us. But today, Daniel, would you begin with prayer for us? I will. Our loving Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to your word today, we don't want to bring our own words, our own thoughts, but we want them to be crafted by you, your Holy Spirit molding and making us in your image. Lord, thank you for giving us the task and the assignment and then giving us the example to serve as you served. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. amen. You know, it is entitled Sharing God's Mission, Lesson Number Four, and we're gonna be breaking it down into five individual components. But I wanna begin with the memory text, which is found in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. And we read, a new commandment mm -hmm. I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And I love this part. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have what, friends? Love. Love, love for mm -hmm. one another. Love is a word that has been so misused and abused mm -hmm. and applied to, I love your hair, I love that coat, I love that food. That's not the word, the way that God intends it to be. The love that God intends for us to communicate to those we know and those we don't know, those we love and those we don't, so to speak, <laughs> love, is something that can only be accomplished by a divine infilling of God's Holy Spirit. And today in the context of hospitality, we're gonna talk about this. My wife is what I call the hostess with the mostess. <laughs> and thank you, Shelley, for giving me this lesson. Uh, Shelley Quinn kind of makes all the assignments and I kind of does and takes our personalities into play, into consideration when she assigns those. This one is one that is very significant in the context of the life of Abraham. You know, God wanted to use Abram from the start and Abram, like most of us, have what we call idiosyncrasies. God doesn't choose us because we have it all together. Yeah. God chooses us because he wants to put it all together. He takes human frailty and adds his divine element. And before we know it, as the Bible says, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we will be like him. Why? Because as Philippians 1, 6 says, he who has begun a good work will complete it. So we're gonna see him as he is and we'll be shocked that we will become like he is. That's what God does. He takes clay and molds it. And when he's done, it is in his image. God wanted to use Abram from the very beginning. And uh, you, you'll see in the lesson today, as we consider Genesis 18, one of the grand examples of what hospitality is really all about. But I wanna read a quotation that sets the stage from the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 138 and 139. And it sets the stage for what we're gonna consider in the book of Genesis chapter 18. It takes us to the place where Genesis 18 unfolds. Listen carefully. Abraham was resting during the heat of the day when he saw three travelers. Now it's amazing, three then and three messages today. Abram, quote unquote, had seen in his guests only three tired wayfarers, little thinking that among them was one whom he might worship without sin. Mm. And the lesson authors point out, Abraham, however, soon became personally involved in God's mission. His involvement as re revealed in this chapter was to pray for and intercede for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. That is, he wanted to see if somehow these people, despite themselves, could be saved. So in a sense, if that is not what mission is all about, what is mission? Mm. Let's go to Genesis chapter 18. 
and we're going to look at the three great spiritual qualities of Abraham revealed in this story. Hospitality, love and prayer, and I'll be dealing with hospitality and that love and prayer is going to be coming in the other follow following lessons. Starting in verse 1, I'm going to try my best to go through 15 verses and if I cover all my seven points, Jill, wonderful, but if not, hey. I'll, get you, <laughs> I'll leave them for you. Contact Pastor John, get them later. <laughs> Here we go. Here it is. Then the Lord appeared by him, to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes. But I'd love to have been there. <laughs> how was, I don't know how Sarai cooked, but maybe one day we'll find out. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf, which he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Then they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, Here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed to the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abram, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. And I like this part. This is kind of like a little divine rebuke. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. <laughs> That's so human. That is so, that is so us. No, but you did laugh. God said, no, you did laugh. Stop trying to be trifling to me. You did laugh. Can you hear him saying that? Oh, yeah. So what elements of hospitality are demonstrated in Abraham's response to the guests? I brought out four very quick things. Uh, while there, he saw three travelers. He practiced most likely uh, what he considered to be the act of hospitality. One, Abraham ran to the visitors. That's one thing he did. He was very, he was very um, attentive. attentive. Waiting for them to get to him was not the case. He said, yes. I've got to relieve their, their whatever, whether they are tired, whether they are hungry. It's my responsibility. He ran to them. And then also Abraham implored them to receive his portions. And we read that in the story. I'm going to give you this. And he said, go do as you have said. Thirdly, Abraham engaged his wife in the preparation of the food. And believe me, if you have come to my house before, if you've not come to my house, don't come to Thompsonville just for that reason. But I tell you, my wife does know how to prepare. Right, Ryan? That's for sure correct. <laughs> That's right. I, 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 she's a great cook. She's a wonderful cook. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then Abraham, the fourth thing, prepared food for their sustenance. And he sat there and he was so pleased as he watched them in just what God had given to them. The lesson uh, writers pointed out, Abraham was aware of his mission, which was to share with everyone the knowledge of the Lord in a world engulfed in paganism, idolatry, and polytheism. As we can see in this incident, his most immediate way to fulfill his mission was through hospitality toward these strangers who seem to have just appeared on the horizon but let me make a point. God does not just appear. Mm -hmm. God always follows his, his uh, Rolodex, which we don't even use that term nowadays. Young folk, just be careful. Rolodex. So let's talk about hospitality. The first thing, hospitality is a gift. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. Mm -hmm. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second early prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. So hospitality is a helping gift. Yes. It's a gift that 
people see the need and they fill in without having to be prodded, without having to be pushed. And Abraham had that. Uh, Pastor C.A. Murray, when he was here, he said, my wife, you are the hostess with the mostest. Every time I come to your house, I leave satisfied. Hospitality is a gift. Second thing, hospitality ministers to others as they would minister to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Matthew 25, 35 and 36, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. All those were done to Jesus. And then he said, well, when did I do that? As much as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. So when you are actively involved in hospitality, minister to someone as you would if it were Jesus himself. Yeah. Thirdly, hospitality recognizes a divine component in the exercise of the gift. Hebrews 13, verse 2. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. Mm -hmm. We never know who's an angel. I could tell some stories, but my time doesn't allow. I'll leave it for later on. The fourth thing, hospitality seeks opportunities to bless others. Isaiah 58, verse 7. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the door those who are cast out when you see the naked that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? In other words, Isaiah is talking about how we look at people's needs and we are moved with compassion to provide those needs. Hospitality seeks to bless others and they look at that as an opportunity God presented to them. Number five, hospitality is evidence of a spiritual person. Titus 1, verse 7 and 8. For a bishop or elder must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable. Mm -hmm. Verse 8. A lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, and self-controlled. So if you are a leader in the church, you, don't, you may not have to be an elder or whatever position you may hold, even just a Christian, it's so good to know that the hospitality of Christ is abiding in you. And the sixth point, Jill, I, I can't believe I made it through all my points. <laughs> hospitality is a gift that strengthens relationships. First Peter 4, verse 8 and 9. Above and above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love cover, will cover a multitude of Sin. sins. In verse 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Abraham was hospitable, and you can too when you're on God's mission. Amen. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pastor John. What an incredible foundation. As we look at sharing God's mission, we can utilize the gift of hospitality. Right. My lesson utilizes the gift of love, and Ryan's going to talk about the gift of prayer, intercessory prayer. Hopefully, we already talked about this already. I'm not stepping over too much on his day because we share the very same verses in Genesis 18. My name is Jill Morricone. Monday, we look at Abraham's love for everyone. You know, it's amazing to me when archaeology confirms what the Word of God tells us. Right. I was reading a recent study. Um, something was published an archaeologist had been excavating in the site of Sodom and Gomorrah. And this, uh, they published their findings in 2018. So this is fairly recent. And they said this, Samples from the site show that an extremely hot, explosive event leveled an area of almost 200 square miles, including the Middle Gore, a circular plain to the north of the Dead Sea, not only wiping out 100% of the Middle Age cities and towns, but also stripping agricultural soils from once fertile fields. Mm. So we read in the Word of God about the flood, and we say, well, we believe that the flood occurred and it was a global event. We read in the Word of God about Sodom and Gomorrah and what happened with the fire coming down and the complete destruction of the city. And yet later, archaeology confirms what the Word already told us and what God already told us. We look here at Genesis 18 and God, after having this wonderful meal with Abraham, uh, begins to tell um, Abraham the plan for Sodom. 
So there's kind of a three-step process here. We see first the investigative judgment. This is in Genesis 18, verse 20. Genesis 18, 20, the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Now, what's interesting, in the previous lesson, we talked about the Tower of Babel. And what did God do there? He came down to see the building of the tower. It's an investigative term. He's coming to investigate what is taking place. In this case, God clearly knew what was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. But he's investigating what's really happening. Then Abraham pleads for mercy. And I won't touch on that because Ryan's going to touch on that. And pleads and says, if there's 50 or 40 or whatever, will you still destroy the city? And then at the end, God makes a decision and says, if there's 10 righteous people, I'm not going to destroy it. Now, it's interesting to me, if you think about, if you were to plead for someone's life, that's what Abraham was doing, for the life of the people in the city, you have to have love, do you not? If you were to intercede, you have to have love. Who did Abraham love? I would submit to you four different groups that I can um, ascertain from this passage and from studying the life of Abraham. So let's look at that. The first group he loved is the people closest to him. Now you can see this clearly as you read the scriptures. You can see he loved his wife. He loved his children. It pained him to give up Ishmael and send him away. We see he loved his nephew Lot in Genesis 14. Remember when Lot was captured? Abraham took his men and went after him. He loved him. We read on a previous verse, a previous lesson, Acts 1 verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. We witness to those at home. We're to love those at home. But many times, I think Ryan, you talked about this earlier. It can be hard, can it not, to love those at home? We can maybe love those we come in contact with because um, we know how to be polite or we know how to be professional or we know proper social graces. But the people that you're closest to, God calls us to love. Mm -hmm. Your spouse, even when you disagree with them. Your children, when they're acting up or mm -hmm. acting out. God calls us to love and to learn to love those who are closest to us. Number two, Abraham also loved those who were at odds with him. Now, in this case, the verse I found, Genesis 13, 8, it's actually his family. So he loved his family, but his family, there was some strife with them. Remember, Lot and Abraham had this disagreement and the herdsmen did. We're in Genesis 13, 8. Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Sometimes it's difficult, not sometimes. If I'm being honest with you, I think all the time. It's difficult for me, I'm just talking about Jill here, to love those people who are unkind to me. It's hard to love those people who think they know it all or those people who somehow rub you the wrong way. Yet those are the people that we are called to love. Those are the people that Abraham loved, tried to establish peace with his nephew Lot. The third group of people, we are to love the people who are wicked. That's all of us, but the people who are depraved and sexually immoral. Look at Jude 1 verse 7. It's interesting. It talks about the city of Sodom and Gomorrah being extremely sexually immoral. Jude 1 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, that doesn't mean the uh, fires of Sodom and Gomorrah are still burning today. It just means it is complete and irreversible. They're completely destroyed. Now, it's interesting if you uh, read, this isn't my lesson, but if you read uh, Genesis 19, you discover that they were perverse, that there was homosexuality going on in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. You also discover there were sexual perversions of all kinds, and Lot even offered his daughters. I can't even imagine that. Mm. But yet Abraham loved 
those people enough. Now, these are the people walking in sin. These are the people walking in sexual immorality. He loved them enough to intercede for them. So many times we might cast aside those people, do we not? And we say, okay, well, we're called to love the people who are like us or the people in our community or the people in our neighborhood or the people in our church. But we are called to reach out to those in the gutter, to those who are um, living in open sin. Matthew 9, verse 11, what did Jesus do? When the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? He loved, he associated with for the purpose of mission and winning them to Jesus. He associated with people who society would have cast out. And finally, the fourth group that Abraham loved is those who walked in pride and are cruel to other people. We see another picture of Sodom. This is in Ezekiel 16, verses 49 and 50. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. They were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah besides sexual immorality, love of display, idleness, pride, lack of interest or love for others, lack of hospitality. Hmm. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 156. With little thought or labor, every want of life could be supplied, and the whole year seemed one round of festivity. This is what Sodom was like. The profusion reigning everywhere gave birth to luxury and pride. Idleness and riches makes the heart hard that has never been oppressed by want or burdened by sorrow. Mm. The love of pleasure was fostered by wealth and leisure, and the people gave themselves up to sensual indulgences. So Abraham loved those closest to him, his family. He loved those who maybe he was at odds with. He loved those who were wicked and sexually immoral. He loved those who walked in pride and were cruel to others. In the final moment, how are we to love? We know we're commanded to love. By this, all will know that we are his disciples if we have love for one another. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. I think the first thing to do, and we don't have time to get into this, is go to God. We can't conjure up love. We can't create love of ourselves. The fruit of the Spirit, the first fruit of that beautiful list in Galatians chapter 5 is what? Love. The, it is a gift. Ask God for the gift of love. And know that love is not a feeling. Love is a principle. You know, Matthew chapter 5 talks about praying for your enemies. You know what that means? Even if you don't love them, you can pray for them. And I have found in my own experience that when you pray for someone, God changes your heart toward that Amen. person. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible thing. God calls us to react and reach out in love. And that is a pivotal part of the mission of the church. Amen. Thank you, Jill. Wow, we're just getting started on sharing God's mission, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. We are going to continue in our lesson entitled Sharing God's Mission, and Ryan Day is going to be dealing with the topic of prayer. Ryan? Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor and Jill. Great start. I'm Ryan Day. I have Tuesday's lesson entitled Abraham's Spirit of Prayer. And you know what, the lesson has us starting off with a couple of uh, texts here. I want to actually first start with James 
chapter 5 and verse 16. Many of us have probably read this before, but I tell you, it's a powerful text just to kind of set the foundation for what we're going to be covering here on Tuesday's lesson. This is, comes from, uh, again, James chapter 5 and verse 16. And of course, the Bible says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Yeah. Now take that in context with what we're about to read in Genesis chapter 18, uh, verses 22 to 32, because we're about to learn of just how this righteous man, Abraham, uh, of course, as we have seen uh, that Joe brought up very clearly, his motivation behind this prayer, his motivation behind seeking and interceding on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah was love. And uh, that's, that's the point of today's lesson, Abraham's spirit of prayer and the motivation behind it. So let's go to Genesis chapter 18. I'm going to begin reading at verse 22. And just, uh, this is one of my favorite stories. I love reading this just because, uh, you know, I, I hope to one day, you know, uh, I know that Jesus is our ultimate example, uh, but the Bible is flooded with so many wonderful righteous men and women that I, I re often read of and I see in scripture and I say, Lord, I want to be like you, but, but give me the heart of Abraham. Give me the spirit of Daniel. Give me the, 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 the wonderful uh, faith of, of Joseph and all of these powerful men and women of faith. It's just so encouraging to know that while they were imperfect and while they were sinners just like me, they had faith uh, that, that just goes far and beyond and we hope to, uh, to ascri uh, aspire to that one day. So in this case, we're in Genesis chapter 18, verse 22 and onward. Notice what the Bible says. It says, Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood before the Lord. So just to put this in context, obviously these three men have come. Obviously this is what we would call, I guess you would, a theophany or a Christophany. This is Jesus in the flesh. Uh, uh, this is, you know, obviously prior to the cross, but he's come to visit Abraham as, as we have already read here in the, in the previous verses. Uh, but he came with two other men. Obviously these were angelic figures of some kind. And what we're reading here in verse 22 is the two angels they went on to Sodom. Now Jesus has stayed behind and now him and Abraham are going to engage in an interesting conversation. And so verse 23, it says, And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Uh, and I don't know how big Sodom and Gomorrah was. I, I can only imagine that at this particular time they were fairly large cities, uh, metropolis type areas of what, what, you know, what would be in the biblical days. Uh, but, you know, 50 people compared to the overall population, you would say that probably isn't, I mean, that's, that's, that's not a lot, right? I mean, you're going to save this entire city for these 50 people, but that's exactly what Abraham Abraham was asking, Lord, if you could just find 50 in the entire city, uh, would you not spare the city? Notice what it says here in verse 25. It says, far be it from you to do such a thing at this, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall, the, sh shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So he's pleading with the Lord. He's saying, oh God, please, you know, can, can, you, can you judge rightly in this and, and, and do what is right to spare those 50 people? Verse 26, so the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Mm -hmm. Then Abraham takes it further. Mm -hmm. It says that Abraham answered and said, Indeed, now uh, I, am but, uh, I am but dust and ashes uh, have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than 50 righteous. Would you destroy all of the city for lack of, uh, excuse me, of five? And it says here that the Lord responded and said, If I find 45, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and says, Suppose there should be 40 found there. He said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 40. Verse 30, he says, Then he said, let not the Lord be angry, but I will speak. Suppose 30 will be found there. Lord, what about 30 people there? And the Lord says, I will not do it if I find 30. Hmm. And he says, and he said, indeed, now I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. Notice Abraham's pleading. He's pouring yeah. out his heart. Oh God, wow. what if you find 50? What if you find 45, 40, 30? Now we're all the way down to 20. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. And then Notice verse 32, I love this. And he said, let not the Lord be angry. I love the humbleness of Abraham because it, it, I, I'll be honest with you. Uh, there's sometimes 
Um, you know, Jill's my boss. Uh, I love Jill to death and she's so kind and so sweet. But there's times that sometimes the, uh, the, uh, I'll ask a question and then they'll give me an answer and it's a wonderful answer, but I, I struggle with, oh, should I go back and, 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 and ask for more? You know, that's just, that's just a common uh, courtesy, right? You don't want to, you want to be humble. You want to be respectful to the fact that you don't want to push and push and push far beyond. Abraham is showing that humility here. Oh Lord, I, I, please don't be angry with me. You could just sense his humility. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but you could just sense the humility from him here. Just Lord, I, I don't want to be pushy, but Lord, what if, what if there's only 10? What if you only find 10? And of course the Lord responds and says, if I find 10 righteous people in this city, hmm. mm -hmm. I will not destroy this yeah. city. My friends, I mean, that would be like the Lord going into a m massive metropolis like Chicago yeah. and saying, if I can find 10 righteous people here, I won't destroy it. Uh, now, that's just an example, but I'm just saying that that's a massive amount in comparison to the potential millions that live within that metropolis region and the surrounding areas of that giant area of Chicago. Uh, it's showing the grace of God here, but also the faith and the love and the intercession yeah. that Abraham is willing to do on behalf of a wicked people that he has love for. And I'm just going to say, I, don't, I can't wrap my mind around that because I'm not there yet. I'm praying each day, Lord, give me that heart. Give me that love. I want to be like Abraham. I want to be like Jesus to, give, to have a love so strong even for my enemies or even for the wicked. I mean, that's tough. And you touched on this, Jill. That's not an easy thing. What is your mission mind? What is, what is that motivated by? What is, what, what, is, uh, what is the motivation and the agenda behind your witnessing and your mission? You know, I, I think of 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 11. If we are going to inherit the kingdom of God, if we are going to be those saints that will inherit God's kingdom, we must allow God's mind to be our own. In 1 John chapter 4, those famous verses, there verses 7 through 11, it says, Beloved, let us love one another for the love of is of God, for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And then verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. What's the motivation behind your witnessing? Is your motivation Christ or information? Hmm. Is your motivation, I get this, is it truth or the truth? Ooh. You know, sometimes we become more infatuated with the truth, but yet we don't have a relationship with the truth. Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, the life. And I only say that respectfully because I used to be that person. I used to be so infatuated with the state of the dead and the mark of the beast and the law and the Sabbath and all of these powerful texts, pillar of faith that yes, we must believe and we must proclaim. They're, they're, the truths and, and the messages of the Bible are so powerful and those great pillar doctrines that we stand on. But are you more in love with the doctrines or more in love with the, the truth of the message more than the truth, the person himself, Christ Jesus? That that should be the motivation behind our mission. Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you. But what is that mind like? Many people say, well, I want the mind of Christ. What is it? it actually, if you read the verses before Philippians 2 verse 5, it tells you what the mind of Christ is. It says in verse 2, fulfill my joy be, being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. That's what Abraham was doing. He was putting those wicked people even before himself as to bring himself before the king of the universe and push and push and push and push and push humbly, yes, but to say, Lord, what if 40, what if 30, what if 20, Lord, even if 10. He was putting him, those others before mm -hmm. himself. And I love verse 4 in Philippians 2. It says, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also the interest of others. My friends, the point of this message is that oftentimes many people are in the situation that they're in because we don't have love enough to humble ourselves before the master of the universe and pray for them, to intercede for them. I know it's not easy, but if we have the mind of Christ, we should be able to reach a point in our life to be able to say, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. Lord, I don't understand why these people are this way, but God bless them. God reach them. God pour your spirit down in their hearts so that they 
can be drawn closer to you and be transformed. That should be our agenda. It should be love motivation and not ourselves. Amen and amen. Thank you for explaining the spirit of hospitality, the spirit of love, and the spirit of prayer. I am Shelly Quinn. I have Wednesday's message, Abraham's mission. Now we're going to see the result of hospitality and love and prayer. I just want to back up before we jump into Genesis 19. I love how you explain this. Abraham was bold with the Lord, mm -hmm. but he was respectful in his intercessions for Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham was a friend of God. Yes. He was so close to the Lord and he understood God's character. But to me, one of the most amazing scriptures in all the Bible is Genesis 18, 25 mm. that you just read. Yeah. When Abraham mm -hmm. is so bold to say to the Lord, Lord, far be it from you to slay the righteous mm. with the wicked yeah. so that the righteous would be as the wicked. Far be it from you. <laughs> Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? This is a rhetorical question. Mm -hmm. Abraham's friendship, his closeness to the Lord, he knew that God is love. He knew that God is righteous. He knew that God, his heart was to save all. And so as he's approaching the Lord in such a bold manner, I love it. It's amazing uh -huh. to me, but God readily defers right. his judgment. 50, 45, 20, 10. But the cities were doomed yeah. because there were not 10 found that were righteous. Okay, Genesis 19. We see the arrival of two angels. By the word, the word angel is also translated as messenger. It doesn't necessarily mean a cr the created being, the nature of the created being, but the position of being a messenger. We do know these were what we usually think of angels, either cherubim or seraphim, and they've come down and taken on flesh, and they arrive at the city gate, and lo and behold, Lot is sitting in the city gate, which means he had a high official position because that was the privilege of public officers. What does Lot do? Immediately, I think that some of the, Abraham's hospitality mm -hmm. rubbed off on Lot because immediately he insists these two messengers stay at his home. He prepares them a feast. And in fact, our study guide does make a lot of parallels between Lot's actions and Abraham's actions. Both Abraham and Lot invited strangers to rest in their abode and each provided food for the visitors. And I would add that each intervened for strangers. Now let's look at Genesis 19 verses, uh, we'll start with verse four. Now before they lay down, the men of the city, these are the angels that are staying at, at Lot's house. The men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. They wanted to lie with them in a sexual way. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. And what happened? Lot goes out. He's addressing the men of the city. And the angels actually have to rescue Lot. They pull him into the house. And they had to strike the savage men out the door with blindness. Now the angels were going to have three angel messages. Mm -hmm. Not three angels' messages, but two angels give three warnings, three messages. Right. John, Genesis nineteen twelve. The men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? 
son-in-laws, your sons, your daughters, whomever you have in the city, take them out of, and this is the angels talking to Lot, take them out of this place for we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So what does Lot do? He rushes off to tell his son-in-laws they think it's a joke. So some, that shows you something's wrong with Lot's spiritual witness. And in verse 15 comes the second warning. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hands, and the hands of his two daughters. So there's four people. And the Lord being merciful to him, they brought him out and set him outside the city. Now the third warning. So it came to pass, Genesis 19, verse 17. It came to pass when they, the angels, had brought them outside, that he said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. So Lot negotiates. This is interesting to me. He negotiated a relocation. He didn't want to go to the mountains, but to a small city of Zoar. And they actually agreed to that. Mm -hmm. And they did not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah until he got there. So the thousands, tens of thousands of people who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah and the little city surrounding them, only four escaped and only three made it because Lot's wife, contrary to the warning of the angels, Lot's wife looks back in a probably a longing way, she looks back to everything she's leaving behind and she became encased in salt. You know, think about the flood. How many people survived the flood? We know there were eight on the ark. I, I imagine that it, it, it amazes me that when Abraham, uh, or excuse me, when Jacob went down after the flood, what was that? About 750, 800 years after the flood, Jacob goes to Egypt. How many people did, went down with Jacob? 70. Mm -hmm. That's all of God's people, all those hundreds of years mm -hmm. after the flood. Well, there was five that he joined. But it shows us something. And Genesis 19, 24 says that the Lord rained mm. brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Yeah. Boy, there's going to be that day. The lake of fire yeah. is going to be one that consumes the wicked in the second death. Four times it's mentioned in Revelation. Verse 27 of Genesis 19, Abraham went early in the morning. He's, he's back still at his camp. And he gets up early in the morning. Here he's interceded. He's prayed. He's, he's just poured his heart out before the Lord. So he gets up early in the morning. He goes to the place where he'd stood before the Lord, where all of this had gone on. Abraham looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain. And he saw and behold, mm -hmm. the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. Mm. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Now I've got to read to you from the Sabbath School Quarterly. The small number of residents of Sodom who were saved has implications for our own mission. Not everyone will be saved. Mm. We would like everyone to accept Jesus and his plan of salvation but each person has free will. Mm -hmm. God never violates free will. That's right. That's right. Our task is to invite as many people as possible to make the choice for Jesus. While we are carrying out our mission, God assists us through the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power to be my witnesses, but he will never go against the will of anyone. Mm -hmm. Free will means that 
in the end, no matter what we do, no matter how much we pray, salvation comes down to each individual's choice. Mm. That's right. Yeah. I want you, I'm so excited that Daniel's doing Thursday, but I want to encourage you at the end of each lesson, we are given a challenge and a challenge up. I want to encourage you to take those seriously, to reach out to people, to know, to put, don't let this just be head knowledge, but heart yeah. knowledge, uh -huh. but never believe that it's your job to save someone. Mm -hmm. It's your job to share. The Holy Spirit will do the convicting. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Shelley. And let's be challenged today. I'm Daniel Perrin. Thursday's lesson, submission to God's will. I want you to compare these two phrases. The first one, I'm keeping my options open. I've had friends who we offer an invitation to come visit us, have a, have a meal, and they don't commit until the last minute because <laughs> let's see if something better comes up. <laughs> Versus this phrase here, I'm going all in. Mm. Which one are you? Keeping my options open with God or I'm going all in? Because there is no such thing as partial submission to God's will. Mm. If I submit to God's will only when I want to or when it's convenient or when it's easy, then all I'm doing, even when I'm obedient, is following my own will. Mm. And uh, I, I can't answer all the questions about heaven, but I can tell you that in heaven, sinlessness will be perfect, joyful, eager, blessed submission to God's will. And this right here is our training ground for heaven, to learn to submit to God's will. And when we respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit in Christian service, that leads us to submit to God's will. Now, Thursday's lesson highlights Abraham's, Abram's response to God's call, his obedience response in Genesis chapter 12. And I would recommend to you that chapter in Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, the call of Abraham, especially pages 125 and 126. But I've spent a lot of time thinking about Abram because of my family's experience over the past two and a half years that has really driven some things home to me. In chapter 12 of Genesis, God calls Abram and says, leave your home, leave your country, leave your family, and go to the place that I will show you. Hadn't shown him yet. And then in verse four, so Abraham departed according to the word of the Lord. I had taught at one of our Seventh-day Adventist schools for 18 years, and I was comfortable there and content. And in the few minutes that I have, I can't give you very many details, but I want to let you know that I've, I've come to the conclusion, I did, that there is, no, uh, there is no coincidence with God. God had been moving upon the hearts of myself, my wife, and our kids, moving us to be willing to step by step, not with the whole picture in mind, be willing to take one step at a time. First of all, just to consider planting a garden, which was to open us up to the willingness to move out of the city. And so then our willingness demonstrated by preparing our house for sale. We didn't have anywhere to go and there was nothing we could afford. And we packed up into boxes, everything in our house that we did not immediately need. We were praying earnestly day and night for God to lead us into what he would have us to do. And uh, we had no specific instruction, but we knew God is moving us somewhere. And so I waited literally in that summer before that next year, I waited until the last minute to submit my contract saying, Lord, if you have another place for me to go, then I, I wanna leave that door open as long as possible. But God did not open another door, so the school year began and I continued teaching that year, praying earnestly. And it was at that point that God began to put up on our hearts, I'm gonna move you and I'm gonna move you far away. Uh, and this was confirmed through our Bible reading, through spirit of prophecy reading, through our personal time of prayer repeatedly. The issue was clear, are we gonna obey God or are we going to kind of do our own thing? So I talked to my principal. I said, I just want you to know, we're two months into the school year. I said, this is not what I expected, but God has told us he's gonna move us. And I don't know when, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna be sometime soon. My gracious principal said, all right, good. Skipping lots of detail, well, not, not good in that way, but he was supportive of me. 
So I began to look, where might God be leading us? Where's a home? Where's a job? And God opened up nothing to our, uh, to our eyes. We knew that if we needed, uh, that the next step would be to list our house for sale, skipping lots of details here, but without knowing where we were going, without having a job offer, without having a home or any place to go, against the advice of our realtor, who's the only human I talked to about this, um, we listed our family for sale. Sorry, listed our home for sale, not our family. <laughs> That's a big difference. <laughs> yeah. We had offers on day one. Within a couple of days, our house was under contract. And I said, Lord, are you really going to make me tell my principal, the administrators, that, and I have nowhere to go? Lord, are you really going to make me tell my co the, the colleagues? Lord, are you really going to make me announce to my students I'm leaving and I don't know where I'm going? Lord, are you really going to make me do that? And yes, there were tears involved. And one person was bold enough to say, what if God doesn't open a way for you? I said, he's going to open a way. What if he doesn't? Then we will pack our stuff in the U-Haul and we will drive away. In the back of our minds, we knew that's what it was going to come down to. Later on that day, only after we had stepped out in faith, uh, God revealed to us unequivocally, undeniably, very specifically, we were to go to Illinois. Not where in Illinois, not what for, no home, but go to Illinois. And I realized at that point, God has a plan for me. I started to get job offers at that point from all sorts of places other than Illinois, but I could get nobody in Illinois to respond to a phone call, email. I wanted to have everything under my control. I wanted to know where we were going and God would not let me. I tried to fly back here. God would not let me buy a plane ticket. I know how to buy plane tickets. God would not let me come here. He wanted me to come here trusting in him. I wanted things under my control. I hate these words, but to make a long story short, our house was empty. Our furniture, everything that we couldn't, we had, that we couldn't fit into the U-Haul was packed. Uh, the car was on the trailer behind the U-Haul. I was in the U-Haul. My family, the dog, the five kids, a couple kids with me, the household plants, house plants in the suburban with my wife behind. And there we were. We drove away. No home to go to, no job to go to, no one humanly expecting me, no human preparing a place for me but God. And we left and drove away. We didn't know where we were going except to Illinois. Go to Illinois, that's all we knew. I wrestled with God on that five-day trip like Jacob going back down to where he used to live. We stopped and prayed at every state line, at every place that we, every hotel we stopped. I can vividly remember each hotel. And God confirmed us as we crossed the state line into Illinois. We thought, okay, north or south. We think we're supposed to go south, God. And God, God laid upon our hearts and he confirmed it in his mighty way. Go forward, go the way that, that I have told you to go, go south. At each stage of this journey, and I've left out so many details, the path was not clear, the whole path, but the next step, are we gonna trust God? And this was the issue. Am I gonna learn how to trust God? Am I gonna be willing to leave things behind? Am I gonna be willing to give up comfort and convenience and familiarity? Because we're all gonna to have to do that and follow God's will. I'm not sharing this story because I am anything special. I'm certainly not. But I want to encourage those of you who are in a position right now where God has placed before you a decision that's really hard. Mm. And those come over and over again. In fact, since that time, I've said, God, didn't I already prove to you I'm willing? <laughs> it's like, no. <laughs> yes, you, you, you proved you were willing then, but I want to take you farther. Yeah. I, I want to grow your character even more. And God has been faithful. The place where I live with my family right now was God opening the door. The place where I work right here, God opening doors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I learned to hold those things loosely in my hands, that they don't belong to me. Of course, my human nature says, I want, I want to control it all. I want to know it all. I want to share with you uh, just a little bit that encouraged me in this experience from the fourth volume of Testimonies from the Church, for the Church. It's a chapter called Go Forward, dealing with the Israelites at the Red Sea, Exodus 14, verse 15, that says, And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Mm -hmm. The sea was still closed at that point. So on page 25, Testimonies, volume 4, the divine command was go forward. They were not to wait until the way was made plain and they could comprehend the entire plan of their deliverance. God's cause is onward and he will open a path before his people. To hesitate and murmur is to manifest distrust in the Holy One of Israel. 
He might have saved them in any other way, but he chose this method in order to test their faith and strengthen their trust in him. There are times when the Christian life seems beset by dangers and duty seems hard to perform. The imagination pictures impending ruin before and bondage and death behind. Yet the voice of God speaks clearly above all discouragements. Go forward. We should obey this command. Let the results be what they may. Even though our eyes cannot penetrate the darkness and though we feel the cold waves about our feet. The Hebrews were weary and terrified, yet if they had held back when Moses bade them advance, if they had refused to move nearer to the Red Sea, God would never have opened a path for them. In marching down to the very water, they showed that they had faith in the word of God as spoken by Moses. They did all that was in their power to do, and then the mighty one of Israel performed his part and divided the waters to make a path before their feet. I don't know what issue it is that God has brought you to right now or will in the near future. And it may be that reaching out in service to someone who is difficult to serve and giving of yourself in a manner that would put you at disadvantage. But when God is calling you to go forward, it's worth it. And God is faithful. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Dan. Amen. Well, I could so identify with your story. I was sitting over here just swallowing, thinking how God leads to. It's been a really powerful lesson. Just want to encourage you, my day was on love. Maybe there's people in your life right now that you don't love, people that you struggle with. I just want to encourage you to get into the Word and ask Jesus to break those barriers down in your heart and in your relationships. Amen. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 says, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Well, what's rattling through my brain is the parable of the seed and the sower. God provides us good seed. Our job is to go out, cultivate the ground, make relationships with people, plant that seed, but only God gives the increase. Only God can actually harvest that soul. Mm. The greatest example of going all in, John 1, 14, and the Word became flesh Amen. and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. And that's good news for us. Amen. Amen. Wow, well, thank you everyone. Thank you, Daniel. I was walking with you through that story. It parallels so much how God leads. God leads his dear children along. Thank you, Jill. Right. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Shelley. And God wants to lead you too, friends. You know, Abraham's story is one that so many of us could identify with. And we're looking forward to the very next lesson, which is in, entitled number five, Excuses to Avoid Mission. But let me leave this thought with you that is so significant. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive as an inheritance, obeyed. Yeah. And he went out not knowing where he was going. May God bless you as you continue trusting him. You don't need to know where you're going, but God knows where. And when you are faithful, God's mission will become your mission. We look forward to seeing you next time.